So I want to talk about weeds for the next half hour or so, and hopefully I'll leave some time for some questions. Weed control is a tricky business to be in. Everyone will recognize your failures and hold you accountable, but rarely will you get a pat on the back for any successes that you managed to accomplish over weeds. And I just want you to take notice that I do take notice of fields without weeds, although I do notice the ones with weeds more. So hopefully you're not one of those. Um, you can't talk about 2015 without talking about the drought or dry conditions. Here's a map showing the pasture uh, moisture levels. We are looking at dry areas never experienced in over 50 years last year. And we are on our verge of that happening again if we don't get any snowfall. So this is a fairly conservative map. Uh, this is the pasture moisture levels, which has intact vegetation to retain that moisture. Cultivated areas did not have that plant community to retain as much moisture as the pastures. So uh, if you ever heard of any of the farmers complaining, it was warranted last year. Kosha did extremely well in 2015 with the shift in dryness. Uh, Kosha does very, very well under dry conditions. A bit of a hard weed to catch. Um, no showy flowers. You usually catch it in the fall when it turns a little red. Then it might catch your eye. But other than that, it's just green, right? And it was known as a southern Alberta weed. Now it is becoming more established in central Alberta and even into the Peace and up Fort McMurray region. This is pictures from Alberta in 2015. The top one depicts a field of kochia, what was left after harvest. That is kochia in the ditch on the bottom left, drifts in a ditch, and that fence is entirely covered in kochia. So kochia is notorious for breaking off and blowing in the wind in the fall, and that's how it disperses its seed, and that entire fence. So these pictures were taken from Acadia just to show how well kochia did this past year. And concerning thing with kochia, we do have glyphosate-resistant kochia in Western Canada, it's namely in Alberta. And that was discovered a few years ago, and we haven't actually been able to quantify where all those locations are, so all these other plants that are coming in could be glyphosate resistant as well. Goat's beard. I took a lot of numerous calls on this giant dandelion seed head. What the heck is it? Um, goat's beard did exceptionally well with the dry conditions and it does have those huge dandelion like seed heads. And so this one did very well in 2015 as well. Also known as Western Salsify, if you know that name better. Russian pigweed, another one that did exceptionally well with all the dry conditions, can get quite huge. You know, we're talking a meter and a half for a weed in a year. Again, no showy flowers, mostly a green plant, probably won't catch your eye, but it does retain those dry stalks. Uh, even now, as I'm driving, I can still see Russian pigweed sticking up. Um, so that's kind of the telltale thing to be looking for, is those old stalks remain standing for quite a while. So now, those are the kind of the weird, the weird ones that I noticed uh, in 2015. I want to concentrate on some weird things that have been happening in Alberta that have sort of been of interest in the weed world. Flowering rush is one of those. This is the plant. It is an aquatic. Uh, it was sold as a pond plant up until 2010 when we put it on the act and we tried to stop that sale of ornamental uh, distribution. A pretty plant, pink-purple flowers, triangular stems is the key on flowering rush. And so flowering rush is extremely challenging because it does reproduce through rhizomes. So you can see the top picture there, stems stacked on top of each other. And that will go for miles if you let it. You'll notice the little bulbules on the side there. That is enough to start a new flowering rush plant. And so if you're walking, anything walks through flowering rush, those bulbs will break off and float downstream. It will grow completely submerged. That's the bottom picture on the left-hand side, so you might not even see it poke up above the water line. And the bottom right-hand picture is anytime a, a rhizome breaks off, usually it will continue to make roots so that it's ready to go as soon as it hits uh, soil downstream. Extremely challenging for control. So it was sold as an ornamental up until 2010, 
and then we put it on the act in 2010 and then we got everybody educated on what they were looking for for flower and rush and we found a lot that had already escaped so we have it in the sturgeon river those are the three pictures on the left mostly in the saint albert uh, region of the sturgeon river we have it in the calgary zoo in the prehistoric park with a planted on purpose so next time you're at the calgary zoo take notice in the ponds there's flower and rush there uh, it's in the Bow River, that's the top picture on the right hand. Bow River, yes, before the flood of 2013. Yeah. And the bottom right hand picture is the headwaters going into Chestermere Lake. So downstream of Calgary going into the irrigation district. Agriculture gets a little nervous when anything threatens our irrigation districts. Pretty impressive, right? Are we a little scared by all these pictures? This isn't the worst of it, folks. This is the worst location in Alberta. All the green that you see in the water in this lake, that is all flowering rush. It was allowed to grow for 10 years, pretty well unchecked. Uh, they have been using aquatic weed harvesters to keep access to their boat launches, so they have been chopping it up and making it worse. But at the point, they didn't know what it was. They just thought they were keeping their boat launches free and clear. So we've sort of missed the prevention side of things on Flower and Rush, and now we're just going into control. We have tried many, many things with Flower and Rush. So we have tried attempting to clip the flowers, either by foot or by boat, trying to stop seed production, because it does have seed production. Uh, that didn't really work that well. Uh, we have tried cutting and pulling, and this is that same lake where they're actually you know, trying to keep their boat uh, launches open and their beach open. So this is the amount of biomass that they're actually dealing with there. Again, the weed harvesting has been occurring in two locations, uh, probably making it worse. Although we want to try this as a control measure, just at a more regiment, uh, timely scale. So don't hate this yet. Uh, we've even gotten creative and thought, okay, well, we can't really spray herbicides easily, but maybe we can steam them and it will act like glyphosate, where it will burn off the tops, right? Didn't really work. We didn't get the temperatures that we were hoping to reach through steaming. Uh, we've also tried dredging. The he headwaters into Chestermere Lake with the Western Irrigation District has actually undergone dredging, mostly for sil silt removal. So they concentrated on the lower part of the ditches, not really on the banks where the flower and rush was. Didn't really work that well. And then last year, uh, we put herbicides in the water. And I think people that push paperwork through regulations can really appreciate that this was no small feat. There was special use approvals, there was emergency uses for herbicides, there was a lot of paper. D uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans had to approve this. We got all the approvals in place, we sprayed Flower and Rush, and it looked beautiful the day after. And with, we, so we sprayed Diquat, which is reward. And so it's a contact herbicide, so it will burn off the top. It does not get translocated down to the roots. So we know that we have a battle against us in getting down into those roots. So we're gonna have to do a couple applications of Diquat to continually burn off the tops, exhaust those reserves in the roots to really gain a foothold on Flower and Rush. So there was actually two applications of Diquat in the Red Deer area uh, on this, this creek, this Buffalo Creek. So this one was, was a dream to attack because there was basically the town of Innisfail, the county of Red Deer, uh, environment and parks, transportation, and one private landowner. Only five players at the table. Not all uh, occurrences are as a dream like this one. So in next, in 2016, we are gonna hit Lake Isle. Uh, that's the big bad one of infestation. And this one has public use of about 600 people of the lake any given summer. Um, multiple camps are located on the lake. Environment, transportation are all involved as well. Two counties because the lake is divided. So that's where we're headed. The next one on the right is Chestermere Lake. So we're looking to target that one as well for some control measures. This one is used for drinking water. Herbicides are a bit of an issue there. We could um, provide other sources over 24 hours if we use Diquat, so it's not out of the question, but they're not quite there yet. 
and it's used for irrigation, so that pretty much negates most herbicides, but diquat could still be used because there is a small enough window between irrigations. We could have some, some success there. So that's flowering rush. So no easy small feat. This one is challenging. Um, and this is just the beginning of aquatics. We have a few others that are starting to trickle into aquatics. Aquatics are extremely difficult. And I think you can appreciate the paperwork involved in putting herbicides. We're actually even changing the code of practice because that only allows diquat to be applied in the water. We need more tools than just one herbicide. So we're actually changing the code to actually address some of these aquatics. So here in 2006, we're hoping to try herbicides again. We're going to be doing the reward in the diquat. We're also doing an emergency use on habitat a new um, herbicide for Canada to put in the water. Uh, we're looking at barriers. So you might be familiar with rig mats, some version of it. We're looking to put that down in the water and see if that helps create a barrier and sort of exhaust flowering rush. We are looking at the aquatic harvesters because they're already on the lake, they're at our disposal, but we want to have hard hitting targeted timing. So we want like every two or three weeks we go out and we weed harvest, and we just keep mowing it down and hit it that way. And we're also getting creative. Um, I put in an application to get a dredge down in Chestermere Lake, and we're going to diver-assisted vacuum dredge the entire bottom of the lake. Yes! This is awesome, people. I even called a diver dredge company in Edmonton, and they didn't laugh at me. They're like, this sounds like a really good idea. And I said, yes, OK, it's feasible. So. We'll see if my application is accepted. Next up, weed, knotweed. Now this isn't your prostrate knotweed, agricultural weed, sidewalk weed. This is not the same, this is knotweed. This is what knotweed looks like. It is like a shrub type plant, looks like bamboo a little bit in the stem. They kind of zigzag, huge. This, so this is a contingency of Albertans that went out to BC in the bottom right hand corner. And so it's huge. It can get up to like 10, 12 feet tall. Also, loved as an ornamental in BC, but, and we didn't think we had that much of it, but lots of people have been going to BC liking it and bringing it back, unfortunately. So there is three on the act. There is the giant knotweed, which is the big leaf. And then on the far right is the Japanese. And then there's a hybridized between the two of them. We have all three prohibited noxious, on the Weed Control Act, so we're looking to eradicate them from Alberta. This is what knotweed can do. It will mon monopolize any little crack on infrastructure and will wedge it apart. It has been known to do this on foundations, um, retaining walls, asphalt, brickwork, anything you name that has a little weakness, a little crack, it will bust through. And I did have one in the, the greenhouse in a pot and it actually blew the pot apart after a couple years of growing in a pot. So it, very strong. So we had some awareness from BC. It was uh, showcased in a McLean's article, what the plant that's eating BC, and BC is inundated with knotweed. And so it was picked up by the current CBC News, CBC Radio, and those reports started infiltrating into Alberta. We knew prior to this that we had a few locations. I think we were up to maybe three or four. After all this public awareness, uh, we found a lot more. There was probably about 15 new ones came in, and unfortunately, they all came in in urban settings. And we found them when they were already eight to 10 feet tall. So we didn't have a whole lot of you know, good control measures at this, po at this point. So we, we have uh, allowances in urban settings to, to put glyphosate on these knotweed plants in a foliar application. What we really want to be doing is stem injecting. So this is the picture on the right. So they've actually made this special piece of equipment to actually penetrate these hollow woody stems and inject full strength glyphosate and then it translocates through the plant and kills the plant. Way better control than just the foliar. So all we had was foliar. The last thing we wanted was homeowners to be um, going like this uh, with glyphosate, 10 feet in the air. Dra drift was definitely a concern. So stem injection is where we wanted to be. 
Environment interpreted the label. Since stem injection wasn't specifically stated on the label, and there was no massaging the interpretation, uh, they did not allow us to go ahead with stem injection. All we were allowed was foliar. So through the winter, we have now got Monsanto agreeing to put uh, stem injection on a glyphosate label. And BC is also helping us because they're going after the same thing. They had been interpreting the label a little bit loosely and had been going ahead and stem injecting, and they have since backed off on that support. So things are moving. So next, in 2016, we hope to hit all these stems with stem injection. And I assure you, you have to inject every stem. And so this is just one location, and this really is pushing the boundaries for municipal governments. Uh, the city of Edmonton is now working on five separate locations and where they have never gone on private property to help control measures, this one is making them do it. The last thing they want is someone to go in there, chop all these off, throw it over a fence, dispose of it improperly, and then have tons more locations, right? So they are actually stepping up, providing bins dedicated to this material because it can re-sprout from all those nodes that you see can re-sprout and start new plants. So this is really pushing the boundaries for municipalities. And so Calgary is in the same boat, St. Albert, Sherwood Park, Edmonton, even county locations like Drayton Valley, they are all facing this and we're really pushing for them to be involved in this plant and the disposal. I even had people calling me with this plant in five gallon bale buckets that they brought back from BC and they got a little concerned and it did turn out to be knotweed. So we did save some BCs, given us Albertans more. So unfortunately there's no inspections from BC to Alberta, right? So you can't catch, can't catch these garden swaps. Um, next, I'd like to touch on Jimson weed. This is what Jimson weed looks like. Um, just out of curiosity, how many heard of this plant in 2015? So a few out there, we didn't quite get the same exposure probably to your group as we did in the agricultural uh, fields. This one is toxic to people and livestock. Um, pretty low amounts can, can kill you. Uh, as many as like 12 seeds alone was killing a uh, child and it is documented. Uh, all over the world, this plant does kill people and livestock. So this is what we were um, finding in late in the season, in August. Uh, I got three separate, I think I have to cover it later. I'll go over the identification. So it towers above crops, and that's why people were ca uh, catching it in August, because they were out there swathing, and they saw this alien plant um, towering over their, their uh, crop canopy. And they're like, I've never seen this weed before. It's not common to Alberta. It's not common to Canada even. It's quite rare to actually see this plant. So spiky pod, the seed pods are probably two, at least two inches tall, so fairly substantial. The plant can get about a meter and a half tall and red stem, spiky, very branchy, looks you know, pretty intimidating. These are the, th the series of pictures that came across my desk in the matter of two days from three different counties. So we have a pretty good uh, relationship with Egg Fieldman across all of uh, Alberta. So the top set of picture came from Westlock. Very good identification pictures, by the way. Um, Barhead was the next set that came the same day. Again, beautiful pictures. I can see all the details I need to. Leduc was the last set of pictures. Again, I was like, why am I getting the same plant submitted by three separate counties? And this plant is not supposed to be allowed entry into Canada. That's the main key, right? Jimson weed is listed under the Seeds Act, under the Weed Seeds Order, as prohibited noxious. So this is federal legislation. So the Canadian Food Inspection Agency looks for this plant in all seed imports, and if it's detected in any amount, just one seed was found, that import is not allowed entry, denied, right? Um, so we found this in canola fields all over Alberta. Very concerning. So we did a weed alert after a couple more cases came in. We quickly 
flooded the market uh, with information, what they were looking for, who to contact, how to dispose of it, and then we started tracking the reports, trying to get the information out there. By the end of summer, we had 12 counties reporting Jimson weed. Now, these aren't in huge amounts. Usually, a field would have a couple plants pop up here and there, but still concerning. How was this plant entering Alberta when the Canadian Inspection Food Agency was supposed to be stopping it? There was no shortage in spreading the word. As a weed specialist, I dream of the plant that gets the media light and I can get some attention, um, kind of like those zebra mussels are getting all the time. Us terrestrials have been trying to get that limelight for the whole time, or time and then mussels come in here in two years, they have million dollar programs. Oh, anyway, I'm not just. So anyway, so there was no shortage of uptake on this, this news story. Everyone was talking about it. It was on Facebook, everything. But then communications shut me down. I wasn't allowed to talk to nobody because there was concerns of what this actually meant for the industry. It was also complicated by ornamental locations uh, reports. So Jimson weed was being reported in gardens as well as flower beds. So we think that there's also been contamination of garden seed, say radishes or something, and as well as wildflower mixes. So we had those reports. Those were not the priority though. The priority was the ones coming in to crop. And then we also did have the angel's trumpet, another datura just as toxic as the Jimson weed. So people were really concerned that they were allowed to purchase plants, namely these angels trumpet. They, they were selling them and they were allowed that, that could kill their kids and their dogs and any other thing that happened to walk by and ingest it, right? So very concerning, opened a lot of lies in, in Alberta. Um, our department needed to know livestock exposure. We were getting calls because people were cutting down canola, they knew that they saw it, but didn't know what it was, continued to swath it, couldn't find it, and they were feeding that, that stubble due to feed shortages back to livestock. What was the implications of that? No one has ever faced gypsum weed in canola before, so we had no data to draw on. So we think that the relative risk is low, but we're still not sure. Human exposure. What's gonna happen? We had reports of uh, farmers pulling the plant and going to the hospital. We contacted Alberta Health. They were unable to confirm that that actually happened. They have the ability to query um, through the system uh, admittances. They weren't able to confirm that that happened. Food safety, canola is going for canola oil pr production. What does that mean on the bigger scale of things? Trade implications, does this mean anything in the worldwide scheme of things? Probably not, Jimson weed is a worldwide weed, but we don't want it to be established here in, in Canada and threaten anything involved with our canola industry. And legislation. So the federal government did have authority over the seed that was being imported in seed, but once it was growing in Alberta, they had no authority and neither did we. How do you get people to pull something you have no authority over, right? So we did everything on voluntary basis. We are now trying to get some legisla legislation in Alberta to help, help us pull this plant for next year. So steps for new 2016, we will be working on an awareness campaign. You may see some of these. Um, there's about 20,000 being printed right now. And ask me if I'm a little bit nervous about my name and email and phone number being on these packs. I'm a little nervous, but we needed one point of contact really to get all the reports in one centralized location. So that's where we went with. So you can contact me, I'll take your reports. So in conclusion, if you see a plant taking over and you don't recognize, you should find out what it is to minimize its impact. You play a huge role in early detection, rapid re dis response. I can't be everywhere in Alberta to see all these plants. So if you ever take notice of something starting to take over an area, you've never seen it before, you're curious as to what it is, is it good, is it bad, uh, please reach out to somebody. I have business cards, you can come see me. I will give them freely out to you and we can work through uh, what, you're, what you're looking at. Because this, this is common tansy. So there's a few seedlings in that top left-hand picture 
and it has escalated into a quarter section full of common tansy. And you can't tell me that nobody noticed that this was happening until I came along and saw three quarter sections full of common tansy. Somebody noticed and didn't say anything. I don't want this to keep happening in Alberta. Take notice, report it. I can get after these people to do something. I will be nagging on them. I have the full authority to inspect land all over Alberta. I will come, support you. We will get some action so that this does not happen in Alberta.